Okay, we're ready to get started. So I don't know about everybody else, but it's been so great to be back face to face. Um, you know, I've been wearing a mask because I'm still not out of my comfort zone yet, but man, it's just so great to see colleagues again. And, you know, really want to congratulate Wounds Canada on such a great, great, uh, great back first back to back session. So it's been so fantastic. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Kim LeBlanc, and uh, I've been asked to uh, moderate this session and to speak with you today on looking at wound cleansers. So I'm an ENSWOC, so a nurse specialized in wound ostomy and continence, and I live in Ottawa. I, I also work for nurses specialized in wound ostomy and continence as their academic chair, but I still keep a busy clinical practice. And with me today, we have Amanda Looney, who is an advanced practice nurse and an ENSWOC, and Brittany Butt, who's also an advanced practice nurse and ENSWOC. So you can read our full bios if you're interested on, on their site. So just want to start with a land acknowledgement that I live and work in the unceded territory of the uh, Algonquin Anishinaabe people, and uh, I feel very grateful to be able to work in that area. So what we want to talk today is about wound cleansing. And so thrilled that this session, and I'm not sure if it was by design or not, but that our session followed this great presentation by Karen Usi and David Keast, looking at wound infection. And so there's been some studies that have been out there, um, you know, really dating back the past eight years, but we've had some new updates even since then. So what our goal is today is that we want to give you some ideas of some of the new treatments that are out there, some of the new guidelines. And at the same time, then looking at that pure hydrochlorous acid, and we're going to do that through some case studies. So where does wound cleansing fit in with this? You see, you just saw, saw this, uh, Karen Usi show, presented this to you. When you look at this, where does wound care, where does wound cleansing fit in with this? And in my practice, I often find that wound cleansing is kind of like the afterthought, right? My, the nurses, when they ask, when they consult me, they want to know, what do I put on the wound? How do I prevent the wound? How do I, you know, go ongoing management? But the wound cleansing is kind of like the afterthought. And they're often surprised when I'm really specific about what I want for wound cleansing or how I want them to cleanse the wound. And when I start talking to them about the importance of when you clean the wound, don't just clean the wound, clean the peri wound. And when we're talking about preparing the wound bed, that peri wound is so important as well. So, you know, when we look at this, if I can make this work, we look at reduce wound micro, uh, microbial bur bio, bio burden. So this is certainly where wound cleansing fits in, but we can also see a pot place for promoting optimal environment, right? We often think of the environment as being the physical things around the person, but also think about that peri wound skin and the importance of taking care of that environment as well. So you just saw this, it's in the book, and I encourage you all, if you haven't got one already, to pick one up. I believe they have them at the Wounds Canada booth, and there's a few more left up here. Uh, for full disclosure, I'm part of the um, International uh, Wound Infection Institute, so I'm a little bit biased, but uh, I find that this document really helps bring things some clarity and brings it home. So wound cleansing is such an important part of that whole wound bread preparation. And, you know, I can't say enough about the importance of it. And they've put it into writing for us to really strive home that, you know, it has to be a, a, one of the primary components that we have to remove the excess wound, any excess bile burden in the wound, and that we really need to look at protecting that peri wound as well. And there's also then how do you select what wound cleanser to use? And there is no one size fits all, right? It's, it's always, well, it depends. And nurses get so annoyed with me when they ask me, well, what dressing do I put on or what cleanser do I use? I say, well, it depends because it's not one size fits all. So this is where we have to make sure we do that thorough assessment that we're really doing it head to toe, but then we're doing our thorough wound assessment so that we really know what wound cleanser do we need for that patient for that wound at that time? And things aren't static. So you may start with one wound cleanser and then have to transition to another. So it's really important that we do that full assessment so that we know what cleanser we want to use. 
So there's been some great treatment guidelines that have been come out that we just want to dive into a little bit. One was through the wound uh, repair and regeneration. Then there was this document, the International Wound Infection Institute Best Practice Guidelines. There was a journal of wound cares, international consensus guidelines on hard to hard to heal wounds that, and then the NPIAP, and I'm gonna try and do this right, NPIAP, PPPIA and EPUAP guidelines that came wow. out. <laughs> I practice that, okay? Uh, so, and they talk about wound cleansing as well. And now the first three are free, um, free to download from their websites. You do have to pay for the uh, NPIAP, et cetera, guidelines. I, don't make me say it again. Um, you do have to pay for those ones. Some of the institute, some people can get them for free through their institutions. It is a great, it is a great guideline. It is about this thick. Um, I read it over a summer. It took me an entire summer to get through it. But they, in there, they give some great guidance around it as well. So if we look at some of, we pulled out some of the um, kind of key, key things that came out of these uh, recommendations. And one was that all chronic wounds should be assumed to be contaminated or infected with bacteria. Right, so we're not talking acute wounds, but all chronic wounds, we should assume that there's a contamination. So we need to think about how we're going to manage that. And, you know, so for example, um, you know, they hear hydrochloric acid is typically much higher than therapeutic index uh, for sodium hydrochlorate for hydrogen peroxide for key bacterial pathogens. So here they're actually saying that certain cleansers may be more effective than others, for managing bacteria. When we look at the Journal of Wound Care, they said that the presence of a biofilm in hard to heal wounds and its significant contribution to delay wound healing is well documented. And that we should initiate and support wound healing, the biofilm must be disrupted and removed. So how can we remove and disrupt a biofilm? We can't see it, right? So how do we disrupt it and remove it? Wound cleansing is one of the things we have in our toolkit especially if we work in an area where we can't necessarily take a blade to the wound each time to debride it, right? I do a lot of work in long-term care and I, it's not always appropriate for me to do a debridement, right? Sometimes it's, I deal a lot with dementia patients and when they're kind of hit you and punch you and everything else, you don't exactly want to go at them with a the blade. So wound cleansing is one way that I can work towards uh, reducing some of that bio burden. So saline or water rinses, it, it, it will flush, but we got to remember it's not going to necessarily disrupt the biofilm. So we want to clean with intent. And, you know, there's been, there's been a lot of, um, of documents out. Uh, Dr. Christine Murphy did some work looking at um, wound hygiene. And, and so there's more and more people that are talking about, well, how do we, how do we actually clean wounds and what solutions should we be using? And so we know that highly cytotoxic solutions, we probably don't wanna be using those for prolonged periods of time in wounds. And some of us get surprised when we hear that some of these, these agents um, are products that you know, we've long used, such as providine, iodine, or hydrogen peroxide. Um, I haven't used hydrogen peroxide in over 30 years in wound care, but I, and I'm always surprised when I hear that there's some people who do still use it. Um, but certainly I'm dating myself now, but when I started nursing, we used to actually flush these big pressure injuries with hydrogen peroxide. We'd watch it bubble and we think we thought we were doing such a good job. Uh, meanwhile, there were deep tunnels going places. We had no idea where there exposed vessels there. We had no idea how deep it went, but we were doing a good job because we saw the bubbles. So we thought we were doing a great job. I had, when I reflect on some of the things I did earlier in my practice and now, I, I sit back and I think, wow, this is evidence of why we need to stay up to date because some of the things that we did 30 years ago, we would never dream of doing now, such as cleaning with hydrogen peroxide, packing a wound as tight as we possibly could, using donuts to have people to sit on, like all these things. Yes, I'm that old, but you know, it surprises me but it really drives home why we need to have events like today so that we can talk about it and we can change our practice. 
So using topical antimicrobials to reduce bacterial and fungal bioburden and chronic wound levels uh, that don't impair wound healing is based on the principle that the topical antimicrobial treatments can effectively kill the planktons and biofilm bacteria without killing unacceptable amount of wound cells. Now, as Dr. Keyes said, we have to be careful how we talk about wound cleansers because we don't want to suddenly push the using language that's going to push them into a thing where nur as nurses, we need a prescription to use them, right? So we got to be careful with, lang with the language we use. So according to the guideliners, cleanse lines should be used uh, in a to be effective in distributing virines, that we have to initiate and support wound healing, and the bioform must therefore be disrupted or removed. Okay, so we know that, we, and if we already talked about this, that saline and water flushes may not be enough. Then the NPIAP guidelines came out and said the use of topical antiseptics and tissue appropriate strength to control microbial burden and to promote healing and pressure ulcers is one of their recommendations. So this is food for thought that we need to think about the judicial use of antiseptics and how and when we should use them. So we know that topical antiseptics are not selective and may be cytotoxic. So we need to start to think about, as I talk, some of the older cleansers we use, such as that hydrogen peroxide, traditional sodium hydrochlorate, such as Urosol or Dakin's. I was a Dakin's girl, used lots of it, and used to see a lot of peri-wound breakdown. We, we'd see wounds being stalled. So we'd use these, um, we'd use Dakin's for weeks and months in some case on end on these pressure injuries. Gee, the wound's not progressing. And then we'd have an aha moment and say, well, let's switch to normal saline. And all of a sudden the wound would start to heal. And you wonder, well, how much damage was I doing with this, you know, one and one eighth strands Dakin's, which, you know, was basically bleach. And God forbid you spilt it on your clothes because it was like, you, you know, you bleached everything. So this table is in the, um, is in, is in the guidelines. And in here, it's a great table because it breaks down all of the different cleansers that are there and their form and function and some of the safety profiles for them. So I really encourage you to go in and have a look at this and read it so you can compare and contrast what wound cleansers you have available on your formularies. And in particular, we can look at uh, table 11, which does break down and look at the hy hydro, and I can't pronounce words, but the hydrochlorous acid, uh, and looking at the fact that it is broad spectrum, that in its current formulation, it's safe, for, it's safe for use, and that it's not going to necessarily cause any delay and uh, cytotoxicity to the cells. So this is, this is a table the blown up larger where it does go through all the different wound cleansers. So go in and have a look, read the document. You can also go to the website, the International Wound Infection uh, Institute website, and you can download this document for free as well if you don't want to uh, carry it home on the plane or train. So if we look at defining cytotoxics, um, you know, we look at the comparativity as to which products are cytotoxic and which are not. And we can look here and we can see which ones have a pass and which ones we have a fail. And, you know, I'm looking at all the stuff that I used to use at the beginning of my practice and all the stuff that, that I used to routinely use gets a failing, gets a failing grade versus we look up here, we basically have the ones that uh, they've explored, hydrochlorous acid and saline both got a pass. Uh, so, you know, this is just something to think about when you're using products. Now, that being said, there are times when you have to make a choice, right, where in fact, the, the risk of that infection becoming overwhelming is greater than the risk of cytotoxicity. So you may choose to use iodine providine, say, for a short period of time, because that's what you have available, and you're really concerned about this diabetic foot ulcer. So, you know, never say never, never say always, right? So, but we want you to make informed decisions. I think that's one of the most important things we want you to do. So, you know, we, we want you to think about that, the impact on the wound. So now what I want to do is we've given you some food for thought around kind of why we need to think about wound cleansers. And now Amanda and um, Brittany are going to kind of tie it together with some case studies for you. 
So when we take a look at using the, the solution Vosh, and I may say Voshi because when I go speech to text when I'm doing all my things, I have to actually say it that way for I get it to, to write that way. So I think it's actually produced uh, Vosh. If, we, if we're gonna use this type of thing and we're looking at the, the safety of this with our wounds, this really helped me this slide to actually look at it and, and kind of break it down of how our own body actually gets rid of and bacteria and pathogens within it. So you get the pathogens and they're, um, they're actually engulfed. So our body kind of engulfs it. I think we actually have a pointer here. So we get this and it's engulfed and it creates a, a, a little disc around it. And then our body actually produces on its own the hypochlorous acid to kill that kind of pathogen what's inside it. So our body is actually producing this on its own. So if we can actually add it, to a topically as well to aid in that, like, why not? That just makes total sense to me. If our body's producing it to, to kill pathogens, why don't we just add it as well to help? So this is a lady that came to me. This was in uh, August, 2020. And uh, she came to me with a five-year history of pyodermic gangrenosum. So I first assessed her and we looked at, she had a right lower leg ulcers. The, the ulcers were horrendous they wrapped around. So I had to take three photos to get to actually see this. So this is the back of her, of her heel, like up the leg. This is the lateral side of her and this is the medial side. So it wrapped all the way around. It was extremely painful. She was on and off antibiotics throughout the year. She's pretty much kind of constantly, she'd get off them for a little bit, get back on them. She's, and she you know, had kind of a repeating uh, theme with this going, going forward. And just taking a look, you can also see for her, the, the, her wound bed just didn't look great. So I initially started with her, initiated the following kind of new treatment system. So antiseptic soak. Back then we were kind of big on the whole buzzword. We got the buzzword of, of the, of, um, uh, of um, I'm losing my words now, of dealing with bacteria on our wounds and antiseptic and looking at using um, wound hygiene was kind of going around. So I'm thinking, okay, let's look at trying to clean this wound a little bit better. So she was already on using some antiseptic soaps. So we started on antiseptic soaps. Protopic, um, I'm a big kind of user for that, for uh, pyoderma. And we wanted, I wanted to clean up the wound, but being it so painful, we weren't looking at using, being able to do any sharp debridement for her at this stage of the game. So we started her on Santal um, and using, I think I actually used a hydrofair with her and compression. So she needed compression. So she had that, that venous leg ulcer kind of component to it. And these are very, very hard to address when you're dealing with such a painful wound. So you need the pain management uh, to accompany all that, to be able to get that treatment started. And you start with very, very low compression. And she did in the past kind of try some steroid injections, but that didn't go very well. She, did, we didn't, she only had a couple and I am a big user or, or want to use those, but it's very hard to get physicians to kind of get buy-in and get a physician to do it for you. And she didn't want to do that again. So we did have some significant improvement over the year. So one year later, after using antiseptic soaks, we did see that the wound actually had now gone into two wounds. So no longer did it actually go on the back of, oops, on the back of her leg. So let's go back one. Our back side doesn't work. Okay, so this is just on the medial side now. And this is on the, sorry, this is on the lateral side. This is on the medial side of her leg now. And so much, much improved. Pain is still really high, but we were able to get her into some compression. So we were dealing with the swelling and she was using the antimicrobial soak as, she was, as we were going through with that. Her dressing changes were still pretty high. She was every two days with dressing changes and the wound bed, definitely not a healthy looking wound bed. So when I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, oh, you know, how can I speed up her healing process? Because if we don't speed it up a little bit, this is just, this is gonna take forever and she's already had it so long. So when we're looking at optimizing our wound healing, what can I do to optimize her wound healing? So addressing the underlying disease, am I addressing that the best I possibly can with steroids, um, the compression for the venous part, pain management, that's a, that's a really big part for, for these people, and debridement. So what can I do for her debridement? She is tolerating very, very, very light, um, sharp debridement, but most of the time we are using the Santal in combination 
with uh, dressings to, to look at doing that. So wound bed pH, this was new to me to actually go, okay, how can I optimize my wound healing? And I look back at this case study and, and kind of think, okay, what did I do here? And this is what I addressed. I addressed her wound bed pH. And why does wound bed pH matter? So when we're looking at the actual pH, so Dakin solutions, pH around 10, chronic wounds have a pH up in the high in the nines. When we're looking at a healthy intact skin, we're looking between five and six. This is where Vosh sits. So as our wound bed heals, our wound heals, our pH drops. So if I can put something on my wound that is gonna cause my pH to drop into that healthy healing zone, why not? That makes total sense to me when I'm thinking about it. So when we're looking at that, we get as chronic wounds bed heal, there's significant decrease in the wound pH, decrease in the wound pH that actually um, increases, um, it decreases your chance of bacteria growth with a lower pH. So when we're looking into that five, six. So that's, that's, what, that's what Vosh does. It gives me that pH balance that's into the healthy, so that allows my wound to get into that healthy zone for healing. So here we go here. The one thing that we actually started to do, and this was kind of by accident when I look back to this case study, because we were using antiseptics. And at this point, I wasn't, um, I wasn't stuck on one. It was basically because we didn't have any access to them on a regular basis. One, it was sometimes people were going, I was telling them to go purchase them on their own. So they were having to purchase these on their own. We actually ended up getting this one so that we, patients didn't have to purchase it anymore. So now we were constantly using it. And so this was the only thing that I changed in her treatment plan was what I was using as her antimicrobial soak. So when we take a look at this, we can see that her wound bed looks really, really good. So you see February the 28th, her wound bed looks nice. It looks healthy. It's, it's more pink and granulating. And then she comes back to me six weeks later and I look at her wound bed again and I'm like, oh, what happened? So her wound bed doesn't look as good anymore. And um, I, I do her dressings and I kind of go home and, and being the kind of the geek I am, I take photos and I go home and I'm like zooming in really close to kind of get a, a good picture of what's happening. And when I'm looking in, I'm seeing, I can even see the epithelial cells around here are, I'm, I'm losing some of them and the wound bed isn't looking good. And I'm like, is it infected? Do I need to put her on anti um, antibiotics? And, and she hadn't been on them for a while and she was getting a slight increase in odor and drainage, increased burning. And then she brings in her supplies to me and I see him sitting on the thing. And I'm like, the only thing that she did different was she switched back to her other antimicrobial soap that she was using because she had some left over. And last time she said, hey, can I use it? I'm like, sure. And so when she came back, I'm like, so I called her back up that night. And I'm like, just switch. Just stop using anything else. I just want you to use Vosh only. So she came back in and a couple of dressing changes later, she sent me photos. And now we have a cleaner wound bed again. Okay, so the wound bed looks healthier again. So here we have new orthotics gone terribly wrong. So everybody's kind of seen this kind of if you deal with diabetic feet or this is a, a neuropathic foot, he comes in and he's got this horrible wound on his foot on the toe, an 80 year old gentleman, um, he doesn't have any pain. So this is a big thing, doesn't have any pain. So he got new orthotics and he's been walking on them and he creates a pressure ulcer on his toe and um, it, it's necrotic. So what are we gonna do with this? We're gonna treat the infection. So we get them on some antibiotics and, uh, and we're looking at it. what do most people do when you're actually looking at this? So you wanna stabilize the wound. I want it so that it's, that it's no longer deteriorating. And like Kim said, at this point, I'm not worried about like the healthy cells for so much because I don't want the healthy cells to die. I, I, I'm really, everybody just puts them on betadine. How many people just use betadine on diabetic foot? Put their hand up. Who uses betadine on diabetic foot? Not very many. So are you all using antiseptic soaks or you're not using anything but saline? Anybody just yell at something that you're using to cleanse wounds with? Saline? Saline. Okay, so I've been a big user and we see it in our practice a lot. Everybody's using betadine. They put betadine on the, on the wound 
And they'll even do a soak of betadine. So again, it gets into all the kind of nooks and creases in there. And then they'll use a longer, we'll use a longer acting antimicrobial in between. And we tell the patient to, you know, stop walking. As much as you can say stop walking, you, they limit it, right? Because they still need to get up and about. So he comes back. And, um, and so I said, how did you get the wound? Well, I got new orthotics. So he goes and he gets the orthotics adjusted. Great, goes and gets them adjusted, comes back and his toes like worse. I'm like, what happened? So he goes and gets his new orthotic adjusted, but he has a new shoe. And what happens is, is that he got him adjusted for the new shoe, which is too small, right? So now his shoe, he's jamming his foot into a shoe that's a couple sizes too small. So he comes back now with a, with a, a massive pressure ulcer. And you can see he's got a big chunk of bone sitting in here and necrotic tissue. So now what are we gonna do? Okay, so my, my first thoughts, what we're gonna do, we gotta, we gotta stabilize this wound again. So it's going the wrong way. What am I gonna do with this? Well, A, the cause, treat the cause. So you're always thinking, okay, I already had him on antibiotics. I told him to kind of offload, why did it get worse? And that's when we investigated and, and heard about the new antibiotic with the shoe that was too small. So we, he's now on IV antibiotics because his bone is sticking out and, and the toes looking worse. Um, blood flow, is that an issue? No, it wasn't an issue for this guy, but that was, that was my first thought when I'm thinking of it. Do I need to get an amputation, right? Do I need to send him to a surgeon? Because now this is just looking really bad. And debridement, what can I do for debridement and my dressing, okay? So what are we gonna do for this? So debridement, the first thing I do is, okay, yes, and get rid of all my dead tissue. So what am I gonna do for his debridement? Well, I'm gonna try and get rid of all the dead tissue that I possibly can. So I get rid of the bone, wiggle it, wiggle it, you know, wiggle it, a little bit of slice with the, the thing. We got, a, we got a big bone in here and get rid of all the necrotic tissue. So now he's on IV antibiotics. I, I still see that this is more debridement than, than in, my, in my scope of practice. So it's always really important to realize what your scope of practice is, what you can do. Do you feel comfortable doing that debridement? Um, and, and does your area of practice allow you to do that type of debridement? So I have yet to be certified to remove bone that's deep into the foot, um, but what I can kind of pull out, I, I will do that. So, and what does everybody normally do with this? This is the typical thing everybody does in, in, in my area of practice is they pack it with betadine. First thing they wanna do is pack that wound with betadine. And I say, but my issue with this, and I see this in, in pressure ulcers, and I, like, I think this is coming back when we talk about historically, what were people doing? They're using all these you know, high gels and everything else and, and packing wounds with them on a daily basis when we think something is kind of going bad. But the problem with this is it absorbs very little. The antimicrobial effect is very short-lived and it actually kind of creates a pressure point in itself. So be very careful when you're packing pressure wounds with gauze. Even if your gauze is soaked in something, whatever it is, it creates this, you have to move it, it's this big ball, right? So that's my kind of least favorite thing to pack a wound with is gauze. So we started with him with using an antiseptic soak. We used Vosh on him, and then I used a calcium alginate, silver calcium alginate to kind of fluff in there and give a longer acting and then I ship him off to my uh, Dr. Meyer, my guy who does, does foot wounds to, to help fix up what I couldn't totally do. So here we go. This is very short uh, time period where we see him now, he's come back. We started the Vosh soak. And I, I pull this from my notes, five to 10 minutes. I, I tend, I wanna aim for 10, but I know that, I'm not sure the nurses actually do it, but I still see a difference. So 10 minutes is kind of what I aim for. And, and in the past, I used to tell them to rinse it off. Now I don't, I just tell them to pat it dry. And what have I done here? I've optimized the pH for tissue growth. So I'm no longer harming any of my cells in my wound bed. I'm still creating a good uh, antimicrobial environment and disrupting that biofilm. I'm creating a pH where it's not conducive to growth for that bacteria. And then I'm gonna give a longer acting uh, antimicrobial in between dressing changes. So we, here we see between February 10th and February the 24th. 
that's pretty significant change. So that looks really good. I was like, when I removed the bone, I saw that big hole. I was like, oh, I'm not sure that toe is going to go, that spot survive. But here we are. We see some really good improvement. And he went on to heal. 97 year young uh, lady. So this lady is uh, bilateral lower leg swelling, diabetic, CHF, dementia, wasn't able to communicate very well. She had black eschar on her foot. And whenever I see that black eschar with all that swelling, arterial disease, basically I wanna keep it intact. So this is where I do say, hey, get out your betadine, just paint. And, and, and where I tell people to do is paint between the tissue and the eschar to try and keep that bacteria count down there and keep the wound bed dry and don't put anything that's gonna start um, the debridement process. And it's really important to remember when you tell nurses don't debride it, if they stick something occlusive or semi-occlusive on it, it's gonna start your debridement process. So be careful about that part. So we looked at it, despite trying to keep this dry, this opened up. And so now we have an actually open wound. We treatment, um, they were, so then I get a call back saying here, look at this, it's opened up now, it's all sloughy, it's got a wicked acinomonas going on, you can see all the maceration all around the wound bed here, and it didn't look healthy at all, and she's, it's very painful, they, they won't keep a dressing on her, she goes in, and then the daughter says she rips it off two seconds later. So what are we going to do for this? So the only, and that doesn't keep a dressing on. So pain management, obviously, to try and keep that dressing on. Um, and the only thing that we actually changed for her was to start uh, the Vosh soak. Two weeks with Vosh soaks. So with this, the pseudomonas had cleared up. So we hadn't, we don't know, no longer we're seeing that bright green drainage coming from there. The patient, and we, I can assume the patient's dress, the pain was decreased. She was keeping her dressings on at this time. Again, communications were a, a little bit difficult for her. The drainage significantly decreased and starting to see granulating buds in there. And we had a decrease in surface area. So to be able to see those, those kind of granulating buds and get rid of the acinomonas, and the only thing we actually changed for her was, her was her soak. But that led to other things too as well. So chronic, and I'm a big advocate for shared care, and I know that it was talked about, I think in the past, just in the past lecture, about getting your patients involved in their care, to take ownership of their, of their wounds, and they get this sense of pride of, of being able to do it. And I think you get better buy-in as well when you, when you kind of give that patient part of, uh, part of the responsibility to look after their wound. So this lady had, had wounds for a very long time. And uh, I ended up taking her over. She had lymphedema, obviously. And she had lots of other trials that she had done. Uh, she had tried the, the get-go. She was a farmer. She was always working out in the fields. So keeping her dressings on and keeping her compression on was a problem. She never wrapped her foot. And you can see her, uh, her foot there, the forefoot, was, um, was quite, um, had quite a few changes from the lymphedema. So this is her right lateral wound. You can see that it doesn't look that healthy. It's pretty long. We did do some sharp debridement on there. And uh, she had large drainage coming from these wounds. This is uh, her other, uh, her medial side in the front of her shin. So she had wounds kind of all over the place. So treatment. So we cleansed the wound with normal saline. And then we applied the soak. She applied her soak. I told her to apply it for 10 minutes, take it off and rinse it. So now I just say pat. So she pats it dry. And then we applied her dressing over top, mesorb the compression, and we actually tried to tell her to wrap her toes as well. So, and I, at first I was like, you know, wrapping the toes can be really complex and I wrapped them for her to see if she can tolerate it. And she did. But one of the things too, is like getting, if you're trying to get the patients to get their, do their own care and she didn't want to come to clinic and she didn't want to, you know, have nurses come to her homes. So getting them to be able to, she now actually wraps her foot without actually wrapping things between her toes. And unfortunately in the next photo, I didn't, the foot got kind of cut off, but her toes looked way, way better. So make sure that you actually wrap right from the, the tip of the toes when they have all that swelling. So 18 days later, this is, she came back 18 days later. And this is what I was seeing after she had these wounds for years and years. And this is kind of where they always looked. She has antimicrobials or sorry, antibiotics on standby. She was telling me that she would just take them. The doctor just kept renewing them. And every once in a while, when she said her leg gets all red and sore 
and painful and increased drainage, then she would take her antibiotics. So she was very knowledgeable when she got that, those infections. So we started on this and I've now had her, so what, this couple years now, and she has not had to use antibiotics once yet. And the, that, that's the one, the one difference that we've been doing is her, is her soak. So lateral lower leg, medial aspect, so real improvement in the wound bed. You can see her here. This is kind of what we did. Significant uh, decrease in drainage. She was now able to keep those compression wraps on for a much longer period of time. We had no deep tissue infections, uh, so she was no longer on any antibiotics. She hasn't now been for at least two years, and she still has very, very small wounds. They continue to improve. And that's it. We'll call up Brittany. Okay, uh, thank you, Kim and Amanda. I have about three case studies I want to present on BASH. Okay, so my first case uh, is a pressure injury. So this particular patient, uh, he was a 71 year old male and he's admitted with pneumonia and a urinary tract infection. As you can see, he has an extensive past medical history. And one of the things that was a big factor in his case was his Parkinson's degree, uh, disease. And unfortunately he came to us quite contracted. He was also diabetic. Uh, so when he was admitted, unfortunately, he had a prolonged hospital stay. He was in respiratory failure. So unfortunately, he developed multiple pressure injuries despite optimal care. So we had him on an active surface, trying to optimize his nutrition, turning repositioning. We had a repositioning aid. We had uh, turning wedges, all of those factors. Um, but one of the issue was the fact that his head of his bed had to stay up um, quite high. He was constantly uh, aspirating. So at one point there was a possibility that this patient um, would be on a palliative stream. So he did end up with a very significant pressure injury. Um, several wound care treatments were provided over the five months, um, included several different antimicrobials. Um, we also did several rounds of conservative sharp wound debridement, um, but his care had stagnated. So this is when I originally saw him. However, at month two, it had uh, developed quite significantly. It was heavily infected. It was a stage for pressure injury. I was able to go and debride it. Again, I came back, he required more debridement. Unfortunately, despite antibiotics, local wound uh, therapy offloading, this wound continued to progress. I continued with traditional antimicrobials. And then this was two weeks post uh, conservative sharp wound debridement. So at month four, this is sort of what we ended up with. Again, I was speaking with the family. I was talking about the things I could control. I could remove bacteria and I could remove dead tissue, but the growth of new tissue, that is something that his body would need to do. I could only give it the most optimal wound environment. And unfortunately, he wasn't growing new tissue per se, just the tissue um, was being removed. So at this point, um, VASH was quite new. So I had this bottle of VASH. I'm like, all right, let's give it a shot. I got this stuff. Um, can't hurt. So um, 10 days after I actually started the VASH, this is what the wound looked like. And I actually had epithelial tissue growth. And this is for a patient that was deemed just non-healable to actually have, despite the, his limitation, diabetes, the multiple comorbidities he had, I was actually able to get um, a reduction in his um, necrosis and actually get epithelial tissue growth. This is actually a patient that I'm continuing to see. Uh, I, full wound healing is most likely not um, a goal for this particular patient. However, wound contraction, reduced bacterial burden surely is, um, and therefore he can have um, a better quality of life. It also was able to provide uh, debridement without being having to cut into this man constantly because it became a bit of an ethical issue because this patient wasn't able to consent. It was just his family. And we were worried he was having a lot of pain, but he couldn't communicate it. So this was a nice, gentle form of debridement um, instead of a very um, 
invasive ones. So the fact that I was able to get that epithelial tissue growth in 10 days um, after so many months was fantastic. So this is another pressure injury case. Um, unfortunately, I get a lot of giant cases coming at me. This is a patient um, that presented to our hospital um, like this. This patient, a 68 year old patient, and unfortunately he had a motor vehicle accident, sustained a spinal cord, cord injury. So he went to a rehab institute and unfortunately he sustained this pressure injury. He was diagnosed with osteomyelitis, treated with systemic antibiotics, and he actually had um, negative pressure wound therapy um, applied when he was admitted to our hospital. Again, also an extensive uh, past medical history. Um, none of our patients are perfect. They always come with a long list of comorbidities. So again, came with negative pressure wound therapy. Unfortunately, when I removed it, it was heavily colonized. Um, there was a ton of purulence coming out um, and the tissue was just not healthy. And I felt negative pressure at this particular juncture was not the best therapy. Um, so at this point, I actually had that previous case. I'm like, all right, let's try, let's try that Vosh and <laughs> work for the other guy. So um, we actually were able to try it on this gentleman. So this was initially uh, what it looked like. And over um, 34 days, I was actually able to get healthy granular tissue in this gentleman and get a reduction um, in his slough coverage. He now had moderate purulent drainage. She did have extensive osteomyelitis, but it had decreased and the odor had decreased. You used to be able to smell this gentleman out the door. Um, so this, especially because this patient was very alert, very oriented. In fact, he would be up in his bed working on his computer. He was very aware. And his goal was obviously to get out and live his life the best he could. So this was fantastic. So you can see this is a 34 day difference of a man who has significant osteomyelitis, a significant infection. Despite that, I was able to get some good granular tissue growth over there. You can see where the rolled edge is actually healed there. And we actually have epithelial tissue growth. It, again, this patient, unfortunately, I, I, you know, I work in acute care. So this particular patient, I'm not able to follow, um, but he left this way and he hasn't come back. Perfect. All right. This is my last particular case. It's a mixed venous arterial wound. This particular case more so demonstrates not necessarily healing, but how VASH uh, can help with pain control as well because it's well tolerated by patients. So this patient had bilateral lower leg venous insufficiency, a significant history. And unfortunately she came into hospital because her wounds had started to de deteriorate. Um, she'd been, been treated with 10% povidine iodine. Unfortunately, they were very painful for this patient and she wanted an alternative. So this is what she presented to me with a significant edema, tons of, um, necrosis. This was a patient. Unfortunately, we could not compress either. We even couldn't get an ABI reading or anything because of the pain in her lower legs. So we initiated VASH on her and. And this was seven days later. You can see the edema had significantly reduced. We'd also had leg elevation, but we actually did have some of the slough removal. But what was the most significant factor in this is that she was able to tolerate the dressing changes where she previously had never been able to tolerate any dressing changes. Uh, so this patient, this is just before she was discharged. Again, she hasn't returned. So I do hope um, that her journey continue with BASH. Um, Again, unsure of if she'd be able to close. However, the goal for this particular patient was more exudate management and pain management. Okay, and this is the seven day difference right here. Um, she was very, very friable. Um, however, there's a significant de decrease in the edema and this patient was actually again, able to tolerate the VASH soaks. That's it, thank you so much. So I, I think we've just seen some pretty impressive cases. And I was just saying it's, I'm fortunate, I think, that it's been a long time since I've seen a pressure injury that I could put my whole head into. So a pr pretty impressive size of wounds. And I think that the two of you did a great job with managing some really complex cases and certainly presented us with some evidence to really show the value of picking the right cleanser for the right patient at the right time and the right method of cleansing. So I think we have a few minutes for, uh, for questions. 
does anybody have any questions for any of us? So the question is, how much bash should you use on the wound? You know, do we super soak it? Do we spray it? And I, of course, I'm going to go, it depends. But I'm going to hand this over to, to Amanda and to uh, Brittany to answer. Yeah, so, uh, so it depends on, it, it does, it depends on the wound. So if I have a really kind of flat wound that, is, um, that doesn't have a lot of um, tunneling and stuff like that, you can be, and again, I, I'm coming from a time when it was getting a hold of it, I was very conservative with it. And I was just like, oh, you know, this is gold, don't use too much. Um, and then I, you can just, I would just soak the gauze and not like so dripping and I would put it on the wound. So if I'm coming in full contact with the wound pad, I was a happy camper. I'm much more generous with it. If I'm dealing with, um, like if I was dealing with like big wounds like that, I would want to make sure that it gets, that that comes in contact with all my wound bed. So I may soak it really good and put it in there, especially if I'm trying to kind of loosen up necrotic tissue, I want to, uh, I'll soak it. I agree. So my cases are always giant. So I am soaking that. And I really try and I always ask for 15 minutes knowing they're going to do 10. So most of my orders say soak for 15 and I just hope for, you know, maybe even a little bit less, but I do use quite a lot only because my, my wound sizes are, are always quite large. And I think that, you know, this is something that brings us out of a lot of our comfort zones and that a lot of times we're taught, you know, you take the normal saline and you dribble over the wound and we're moving now into this whole idea of using soaks as a gentle way of cleansing the wound bed, removing excess debris. And if you're using an antiseptic, getting it in good contact with the wound for a prolonged period of time and really being able to prepare that wound in a gentle way. There are times when I still may spray, but more and more I'm doing soaks. And when I do my soaks, I make sure that it actually extends to the peri wound as well. Yeah. So I'm not just putting the soak in the wound, I'm doing it out around a good two or three inches around the wound so that I'm killing any bacteria that may be gonna be underneath the dressing that may decide to take a little walk back into my wound. So I think that's a great question. Yeah. And I think one of the things just kind of adding to that when you're, why I tend to go and really like the soak factor, especially in the community, when I know my nurses are running in and out really, really fast, I try and get the, them to get their patients to take off the dressing and put the soak on. And that way that cleansing process is starting before that nurse is getting in and trying to get out because she's got 50,000 other patients and being asked to cover yeah. for the other nurse who's now on stress leave. So yeah. it's I, I, getting that patient buy-in to take part of that care. Yeah. It's also patient and family engagement, right? When we look at engagement, we know that patients and families tend to do better when they're engaged in the care and they're actually part of the care team. So if they're willing and able to be engaged in the care team, then we find that we get better results as well. So it's a great way of engaging them into the care. Hi, yes. Kim. Uh, quick question for the team, and thank you so much for the presentation. Have you had much experience with InterTrigo and using that as a cleanser prior to, you know, any other type of care to support the moisture accumulation in the panis? or um, breast, yeah. underneath the breast. Any, so Rosemary, any thoughts can, on that? can always count on you, Rosemary, for a fantastic question. <laughs> okay. And okay. I'm, as you know, I'm a big, I, I, I'm really big into, into Trigo these days and yeah. how can we prevent it and what can we do to manage it? Mm -hmm. And so I've been playing around with using a Vosh in, in the, those spaces, into the skin folds to see how can we you yeah. know, that, and I'm having really great results with that. Yes. Um, yes. You know, the only big thing is, you know, you want to make sure that you, that you're balancing with the moisture. You don't want to leave it in there too, too long. You don't want to add too much moisture. Right? right. So, but putting a 15 minute soak in and then patting dry. And I think the other, avoid the temptation to rinse it off. You don't want to be rinsing things off either. So okay. avoiding that temptation of rinsing it off and just patting gently. Um, I'm getting some really good results with my aging population. Yes. Do any of you guys Thank have you. experience with it? Yeah. So it's interesting you say that because I just got a, a photo 
just sent to me yesterday saying someone with a groin and it looked yeasty to me as well. And uh, everybody wants to put like barrier creams on that, Mm -hmm. but without addressing the underlying problem and the yeast. And so, uh, yeah, she actually just sent it. And I said, just, I I said to do the soak, take it off, pat it dry. And then if you must use your barrier cream or whatever, then go ahead. And they sent it and said it cleared it. It was, it was cleared. Excellent. Okay. Thank you guys. Do we have any online questions? And it's good for using with those, um, you're also your, uh, like your inter-dry sheets and stuff like that, because you can't use your barrier creams and stuff with mm-hmm. that. So I've had some success with that. Thanks, Rosemary. I think we have one in person that I'll go to the online. Okay, yeah. yes. Just a quick question, because kind of like you use, uh, you, uh, and it was great, great presentation, but just in terms of the use of, uh, a Bosch um, have done some virtual consults for some fungating tumors. So something that's totally not mm-hmm. healable, but initiated Bosch is that 10 minute compress um, and just because there was so much drainage and, you know, kind of looking for something to improve quality of life. And in, in both the two situations, one a fungating breast and one a, around the uh, rectal area, really significantly reduced the drainage and the odor Mm -hmm. uh, and seemed to make a big difference in quality of life for these people. And I just wondering if you'd had your thoughts on, on that, because it was again, kind of looking for something when you didn't really have anything. Like you, I, it was kind of a new product out and I thought, okay, I had this lady, she had a squamous cell on her back that with dementia and she wouldn't let anybody touch it. And it became very large. It was foul smelling. And we started Bosch soaks on it and the odor, I mean, we knew we were never going to heal this wound, but the odor drastically reduced and her agitation got a bit better. So I've only had the one experience with it, but I was like, wow, like when I always look with my dementia patients at their behavior and if we can alter and get them more calmer in their behavior and that's something that we saw with that so yeah it's interesting so I'm hoping that we'll, we can actually kind of get some I've had I've had two case studies and actually before I started I actually called them up and I said hey do you have any you know information about using this on fungating and they're like no but you know there's no reason why you can't and I actually had the very same kind of results I I mean obviously you're not going to heal these but it's looking at and when you're dealing with uh, fungating wounds I always want to know what is the issue for my patient what is it what is your concern and trying to address those concerns and often the smell and the drainage is often a concern and I noticed the smell and the drainage decreased when using it on, I had a big uh, breast and uh, one on the kind of one up on the shoulder. And I had, in both cases, I had decreased odor and decreased drainage. We'll go to the online question. Yeah. So there's a few questions. They're all kind of similar, basically around the use of it. So one of the questions was, uh, do you rinse the Vosh after? And from my perspective is, uh, mm-hmm. no, you don't rinse the Vosh mm-hmm. after. Usually I just pat dry. I don't know if you guys have a yeah. different. Yeah, I don't rinse. I just pat dry. Yeah, pat dry. So if I'm trying to loosen something up, especially if I start the family doing the soak first, and I'm trying to loosen debris. So if it's a kind of a mucky wound, then often I will, and I'm, I'm very big now with saying, take dry gauze and, and kind of give it a, a good kind of scrub. Um, so if I'm doing it in that aspect, but it's not something that needs to be rinsed away, but if I think that there's debris on the wound, then I'll tell them to give it a good wipe. And then one of the other questions, almost a prior. So do you irrigate the wound with like saline prior and then soak, or you just use a wash? That's one of the other questions. Yeah. And I think when you're talking about some of those big wounds that you're talking about, yeah. <laughs> cleaning them up first, getting all the loose debris, all that kind of sloth that's sitting there, because the more contact you get with the wash against the, the, the wound bed, that's going to be left, the better off you are. If you're trying to put a soak on, and, and leaving it like that on something that's kind of all mucky, you just take off a dress and do the soak, pat dry and put a new one on. You haven't wiped away any of that loose debris that that you want to, especially if you're trying to do some debridement and that type of thing. You want to you want to be aggressive with cleaning those wounds up that look really mucky. Yeah. Sometimes so I'm a try to keep things as simple for the nurses as possible. So I am a one stop shop kind of person. So I will often get them to, to actually cleanse out all the muck using Vosh and then put a Vosh soak in on top of it. So rather than using normal saline to get out all the debris and then switch to Vosh, I figure let's make it easy for them. Let's have them clean it, clean it out with Vosh and then put the soak in. 
So that's kind of where I'll go with it. Yeah. Now that my patients don't pay for it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, there's just two more questions. And one is really when there's like a narrow silo or like a tunnel where you know you're not necessarily going to get the fluid back, would it be okay and safe to, to uh, irrigate or soak with the VASH into that space? Mm -hmm. I still use soak. So what yeah. I'll do is I will then soak a ribbon yeah. and I'll gently put that down into the wound and I'll let that sit for 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. When we can't visualize the wound bed, we want to make sure we're not causing any further trauma. So I'm a little bit more gentle with that. Yeah, I yeah. agree. I, I don't want to be, I mean, part of the whole thing about flushing is to remove and to, to flush away, not flush into. So mm -hmm. I agree. If it's a tunnel where I can't get it out of, then a soak. Yeah. So, and then my last one is, would VASH be recommended for uh, radiodermatitis? I've personally never used it on radiation dermatitis, but I don't see any real contraindication to using it on that. Have you had? I asked the company again, because I just had a patient who had radiation. I'm like, hey, and they're like, we don't have any experience, but we don't see any why. So I went ahead and started it on that. And um I mean, I've only done it on one person. She said it had nice, and I actually told her to, to, to put it in the, in the fridge for a cooling effect. Mm -hmm. And she said it did have a nice cooling effect to her. Um, so she, mm -hmm. she liked it. Okay. So at, at this point, um, one other question. We have oh, one one, okay, we can take one more. So if I'm understanding the, the question is if there's multiple wounds very close together and you're worried about the bits of peri wound skin in between, I will go ahead and do a soak over all of them because I actually want to make sure I'm taking care of that peri wound skin as well. So, and for 15 minutes and then you'll take it off. And normally we don't see any large amounts of maceration during that time. Uh, any closing remarks? I, I mean, I do a lot of legs, so we have that problem where you have multiple, I, I put the soak on, on top of it and then do it. Anything that's kind of going to macerate it to wipe clear, that skin is kind of comes off anyway. So I think it's kind of helpful just to kind of descale and stuff. So I will put it over and I don't have any issues. Yeah. I, I yeah. agree. I really in that 15 minutes isn't going to cause prolonged maceration because you are going to be putting your protectants and, and your absorbent products afterwards. So with that, we do have to close this session. I'd like to thank everybody for your attention. Thank you to Ergo for sponsoring us to come and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. It's so exciting to see everyone. Thank you.